Our folks, how y'all doing? Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, just give me one second here. Uh, yes, I'm D. Shanger, um, uh, mod and live stream director here at Occupy Toronto. And tonight we got a very special treat. We have filmmaker Peter Mettler. And I just got to adjust the uh, contrast and brightness. Yeah, that's better. Yar, uh, hi Peter. Tell hi. us, tell us, Peter's new film and the time just opened in uh, Toronto, Montreal, and in October uh, had a theatrical release in Switzerland, and it played at numerous film festivals, including TIFF and La Carno. Tell us a little bit about you, dear Pietro, Peter Mettler. To tell you about me? Yeah, not much to tell. <laughs> oh come on! I'm uh, I was born in this city in Toronto. I uh, played piano when I was a kid. Um, playing the piano somehow led me to making films. And my films are like music. Nice. And um, you've been making films since the late 70s. I know you uh, attended the Funnel Experimental Film Theater, the legendary Funnel Experimental Film theater, and you went to film school at Ryerson uh, here in uh, Toronto, and you've made films all over the place: uh, Picture of Light and uh, Gambling Gods and LSD. Uh, genius, genius films, and uh, I know I've known you for a very, very long time, and I'm very I've seen End of Time twice, and uh, I know we've been promoting it heavily here at Occupy Toronto, but uh, it is a genius genius films. You say about End of Time, you, it started about seven years ago, you started making it? Well, the films kind of slide in and out of each other. The last film I did, Gambling Gods and LSD, ended ten years ago. And I actually started making uh, The End of Time about five years ago. So, of course, part of that time is finding money, convincing people to support you. And the real work of editing and shooting was for three years. And we finished it uh, in August. And originally you said that it, it started off basically a film about clouds and that cyclical nature of water. Uh, how did it evolve into a film about time? Because you've had that working title for a while and then they became the, the final title. Yeah, I mean, my films are all very exploratory processes. Um, they deal with a set of ideas usually. And um, then I go to a number of um, places to explore those ideas. The ideas are like filters on a camera. And uh, in the beginning, one of the main pursuits, as you say, was clouds, because I thought they were um, very good uh, kind of omnipresent subject matter that uh, really can show you the interrelationships of things. Can you know, following water around the world, you really start to understand how integrated everything is with everything else, in a sense. And um, I thought it was a very good subject to be able to demonstrate that association or that associative thought process. Let's say. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the process of doing that, um, as one of the physicists in the end of time says, um, weather and time in many languages are actually the same word. Tempo in a time. Exactly. You know, and variation. Le in French. There you go. Yeah. Wow. And I, I think what happened is uh, by watching clouds, watching meteorology, watching change itself, um, the, the kind of consciousness of time took the foreground. You know, what is time? Does it really even exist? Mm -hmm. Is it something that we humans make up to organize our experience? And how much of this potential concept is ruling us, in fact? Like, if it is a creation that we've made for ourselves, how come we're, we're almost defeated by it? And how come nowadays time equals money? Questions like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's where the film gravitated towards ultimately. And and uh, not that 
I would ever give away a film and its explanation, being a filmmaker myself. Uh, the concept of time, uh, your conclusions in, in this film, which is not giving it away because you, you talk about it at the beginning. Uh, My conclusion of what time is? Yeah. Um, and, and has, I've heard you say before, you know, in our conversations, we actually don't actually sense this, but we talk about time a lot in our conversations. We do. I mean, we, the word appears again and again. <laughs> uh, it appears all the time. Right. It's um, if I have time to do this uh, next time, it, it's just it's it's really so much part. Of it, it's part of the fabric of who we are. And Borges, the poet, um, actually says that, you know, time is what we are made of. We are time beings. He doesn't say we are time beings, but we are time beings. Mm -hmm. And that was actually a title for the film at one point, mm -hmm. the time mm -hmm. being. Mm -hmm. um, I remember you, you sprang that on us at home when we did a special sneak preview of End of Time. And Titles come and go. Yes. <laughs> but more than anything, the working title for many years was End of Time. Uh, this. I guess it was. Because I remember you talking about this seven years ago. I mean, I remember five, six years ago, um, you coming up with, you. it was a two-part question. You kept asking a lot of people, and it really stuck with me is, is there any place in this known universe where you could stop time? It was a two-parter. Yes, One, right, that it yeah. could stop time, and two, you got to be able to film it. Yeah. And as it turned out, I mean, the film has a kind of structure of time stopping, but it, it's, a, it's a poetic idea. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if, if time is a conceptual thing, stopping time is also a conceptual thing, mm -hmm. uh, I would say now, and, and, or a poetic thing. And, and, and the film creates an actual construct of someone falling to the earth at the beginning mm -hmm. uh, who's jumped from outer space. Yes. And in the process of falling, and this is, he actually did this, his documentary footage. Yeah. In the process of falling, he had the feeling that everything stopped because there was no more atmosphere. There was no more resistance mm -hmm. to his clothing fluttering. There was no... Um, and he thought... The time stood still. Yeah, that time stopped. And it was so in a weird way, you did film. You know, no, you didn't film it, but it got filmed. <laughs> and you used it as the opening of your film. Uh, it, yeah, I, I could now see that that is a timeless moment. But, yeah. but it, it, ever since you brought that up, it, like, I've been trying to figure out, and the only place that I've reached a conclusion, and it stuck with me, Peter, after five, six years since you mentioned it, oh, yeah, the that the, the black hole, <laughs> the black and that who, okay, I must say, okay, I rarely pan myself in an interview, but if there's any person on earth, because part two of that was he has to film it, and who black better, hole. who better than you, bro? Like, so, you are a genius cinematographer, and doubly so that you write, you direct, you do it all, you know, like, it, it's like, well, yes, no, but, I, like, yes, I absolutely <laughs> understand, but you are a genius cinematographer, so I could think of that comment that you said, is there any place on universe that you could stop time, and mm. part two, that you got to be able to film it, mm. well, so I challenge you to fill the black hole. Still, right, <laughs> well, the black hole's difficult, because we don't really know what it is, it's kind of nothing, so... How do you film nothing with nothing? I mean, it's being, I guess it actually exists. I filmed it because it doesn't exist. So it, I filmed it already. It's like string theory. <laughs> you filmed it already? Yeah. Can we see it? Well, here it is. <laughs> okay. End of time, <laughs> folks. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, I love, love uh, that film. Uh, that observatory, that's in Hawaii, right? That was shot in yeah. Hawaii. And, and my sense... And I don't notice uh, with the stars in the background. You filmed it similar to End of Light, the way you filmed Picture it. of Light. Picture of Light. End yeah. of Light. End, End of, of Time. Oh, that's the sequel. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, sorry. Well, it's the same technique. Yeah, time lapse. But um, a special time lapse. Well, the one in Picture of Light was spe was especially special because um, it was minus thirty degrees. Celsius outside Churchill, Manitoba. Churchill, Manitoba, and we're filming something very elusive, the Northern Lights. You don't know when they'll appear in the sky, and so you have a, a camera that has the oil taken out of it, 
because it'll freeze otherwise. And um, it's packed in battery warmers, the kind you put in your car in the Arctic. And um, it's shooting a frame every five seconds. So it's recording every frame for five seconds mm -hmm. and pointing into a, a the sky and hoping that northern lights will happen in front of it. Well, I think for a lot of the filmmakers watching this, some more technical info, you're using some pretty fast lenses and some pretty as fast, fast snags. As they like could what? be. Like what, what were you using? For well, at that time, that was in the 90s, early 90s. Um, I think we had uh, five, a whopping 500 ASA. <laughs> yeah. Pushed um, or no? 35 mil. We we pushed one stop because it didn't. We didn't want to get it too grainy. Like when yeah. you push film stock, it gets grainy. And it was 35 neg. Both super 16 and 35. And what lenses? And they were um, yeah. Like I think there was one that was even below. You know, 1.8 is usually down there. Yeah. Or yeah. one. We had one that was 0.8. <gasps> the NASA <laughs> lenses from Kubrick. Kubrick used the uh, 0 0.75. 0 0.75. Wow. Four wide angle, uh, wide angle lenses for uh, Barry Lyndon's That's right, for the uh, candle. candle scene. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, talk about the genesis of Picture of Light because we're gonna right after this we're gonna do a movie marathon of all your films in order and we're gonna play them for the next day and a half, uh, back to back to back. Uh, no, no, we're gonna play back to back. I don't know. I think uh, it's twenty something hours, but we'll play them twice. Okay, that makes so it'll sense. be the offline content reel for the next two days till Devine's First Nation show, Thursday night. Uh, so, uh, and we'll repeat this interview at the uh, here and there. Um, yeah. So, so you filmed it very much because uh, it looked that sharp, and and uh, I love that scene. That scene is gorgeous. It's oh, like floating, lights. floating in the cloud, the observatory, and the stars. Oh, in the end of time again. Yeah. So. Credit must be given to who actually shot that. It wasn't us. It was um, the, the astronomer who lived there, who had spent uh, you know, years. Well, it's a, it's a series of shots, in fact. And every night he would put his camera out, like a still camera that could do single uh -huh. frames. Like you can do that today. The technology is uh, readily available to all of us now. And and he would set the camera up and and the heavens would do their thing and the camera would record it. And he um, had a lot of this material and it was actually something I would have done, but I would have only had two or three nights he, to do it. And he had, he'd been doing it for a couple of years. And here I assumed uh, you had shot that. N nope. Okay. Wow. <laughs> there's a, I think there's one of our shots in there, but uh, the sequence <sighs> is his. Yeah. I mean, it's gorgeous. And I, I, I know you said it started out because I've seen the film twice, and uh, and uh, really the second time, the amount of clouds in this film is gorgeous. Like I wow. think the the one panning down with a cloud from the mountain that's at CERN. Yes, that's you're what's following the front yeah. of that. Yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. Well, the film opens with with um, a view yeah. into a valley in Switzerland as well. Mm -hmm. um, where and that was the view from which we edited Gambling Gods and LSD. That's where our editing room was, in an abandoned hotel we lived in for two years. In the mountains. And it um, it's like a, an ocean of, of clouds below you. And when you see that in time lapse, it's quite fantastic to, mm. to see the motion. And then it cuts to literally the uh, range of the Jurassic Mountains uh, right beside CERN. And uh, the, the first day we shot there, we went there, there were these tremendous clouds coming off the edge. And our, our host there said, oh, wow, this never happens, you know. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we were, um, it was a good start, considering um, my interest in clouds at the time. Mm -hmm. and, and tell us some of the places on Earth that you shot the whole film, and even including the ones that never made the film. Um. So, well, what's in the film? Hawaii, Big Island, uh, lava fields there. I also was very interested to see um, things growing. You know, you can you can see the first seeds taking root in, in, in mm -hmm. hardened lava and, and very quickly how it turns into a big jungle. Mm -hmm. And you also see it getting destroyed again by the fresh lava coming down. Mm -hmm. um, Detroit... Um, 
Switzerland, CERN, uh, Toronto, my uh, my home in Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, the floorboards of where I live, mm -hmm. um, where Buddha sat under the tree in Bodhgaya, India, where he had his enlightenment. There's a they say a descendant of the tree that uh, still stands there, and it's a pilgrimage place. Um, there's a little bit of Costa Rica in it as well. And uh, yeah, I think everywhere I shot actually is in the film this time. Oh, the Tar Sands? Well, yeah, the Tar Sands became, the Petropolis, it became uh, its own film. It's not, there's actually no images of, of the Tar Sands. Sure, but you had the film. option to maybe yeah. use it in End of Time. That's right, and it, it was actually made, the, the way it came about was it was part of the research for for the end of time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and because like I said I was following what goes into clouds how it goes around the world etc and and I hooked up with Greenpeace largely by um, serendipity and and um, we went there together mm -hmm. and uh, and ended up making this film Petropolis and then I ended up not putting it in because the film had such a, a strong character of its own already that I, I mm -hmm. felt that was good leave it leave it at that mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, personally, like, I love this film, and it's your best film. I, but I say that about all your films, because <laughs> I, I love your films. Uh, I think, you know, you are, in my mind, the greatest Canadian filmmaker of all time. And, but that's just me. But I think enough people say that. I mean, you've had so many retrospectives at so many worldwide festivals. And here at home, you know, it's sad that, you know, you're not a household name like other filmmakers should be. It's because you yeah. come from the experimental tradition and you're stubborn about that. You want to well, talk about that? Thing. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I, you know, we, we find ourselves trying to get an audience and trying to be popular, but then you realize you become popular if you become commercial. <laughs> and then you're not really probably making exactly the kind of film that, that uh, I want to make or we want to make. So it's this balance of, of introducing maybe ideas um, into the, the mainstream that are challenging, different, and hopefully constructive to our own perception of ourselves, to our own sense of who we are and how we integrate into mm -hmm. nature and society. So we're introducing ideas like that using some familiar language, but not selling out and, mm -hmm. and making something commercial to become popular quickly. Because the, the thing is, most of the support a film gets when it becomes commercial is by industry that doesn't like to challenge. And that's kind of the problem, you know, if there's a challenge involved, then it doesn't seem financially viable. And then the films don't get supported the same way. Mm -hmm. So I've been very lucky to be able to, to, you know, find a place where I still get some support from good distributors and industrial systems. Mm -hmm. You kind of believe in the ideas of it. And, and there's a there's a presence. But like you say, not a household presence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, which is sad. I mean, talk about some of the festivals you've had retrospectives at, uh, well, like full-blown retrospectives. Um, yeah, well, coming up is is Warsaw, actually, this um, March, April, and Hot Docs is doing... Of 2013. 2013, and Hot Docs here in Toronto is doing something this year. Um, <clears throat> Tiff did something in 2006. Oh, hot Docs this year. Hot Docs this nice. year. Nice. <laughs> 2013 Hot Docs. Not, I don't think it's full blown, but they're focusing. They're like showing they're a bunch of films. Yeah. yeah. Tiff did that. Uh, uh, who else? Um, the Festival de Popolo in Popoli, Popoli yeah, in, in Florence, in, Italy. Yes. Uh, the uh, Jeux de Pomme Gallery in, in Paris, France. Uh, you, you this film won an award at Locarno this year, did it not? Yeah, won a small award, nice award to do with. Uh, I don't know how it translates exactly. It was in Italian, you would know, but it's um, to do with our consciousness of the environment. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, I, I, but, uh, uh, il tempo? No, the tempo. <laughs> there it is again. 
simple. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, it keeps zooming in and out. It does that I, by itself. I, no, you know, I, I, we we just installed this. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it does it by itself. It's like R two D two, and it's doing it an exorbitant amount of time this time. It's a new toy. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get a handle on it. It's it, it's with this, but uh, we're getting there. It's on super wide angle. I mean, you you're like what yeah, two and a half feet away. It's pretty pretty remarkable. Actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean this. This is live stream. I think you take to live stream very well. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating because it is alive to the world. Um, Fuzz it, hey, yeah. Spam out the link mentioning the movie marathon coming up. Yes, we are here at Occupy Toronto, um, doing a movie marathon following this of Peter Mettler in honor of your new film. Uh, which is has tell us about the theatrical release history of End of Time and the festivals it was at. Um, well, we finished it in August, not very long ago, and um, I've been at it ever since, showing showing it in uh, different countries. Been on tour, um, mostly in Europe with it. Um, places like uh, Copenhagen, Leipzig, Berlin. Uh, Florence um, and uh, now I'm back home here with the film in, in Tiff Bell Lightbox in Toronto having its uh, Canadian release which is very exciting I've been doing Q&A's at a lot of the screenings and um, it's really nice to get into a dialogue with your audience and find out what they're seeing in the film and it's probably nice for them to hear what I was saying. And you did that in that. Switzerland as well? Uh, not as much, but I did. I did a tour around Switzerland to like seven seven cities in Switzerland. Nice. For, for Q&A. Well, your, your family originally is from there, the Mettler name. That's right. It, and my uncle and aunt even showed up one day by surprise. Yeah. And um, that was quite exciting for me. It doesn't sound like much, but you know that they actually came and saw a film of mine and liked it and were excited by it. That was that was pretty great because mm -hmm. it's not to be expected. Yeah, <laughs> I, I hear you. And uh, and what's next for the film? Uh, you're you're saying some other places it's being released. Yeah, well, next immediately still still on tour. Um, Palm Springs is beginning of January. Which will be interesting because that's kind of the Hollywood, mm -hmm. <laughs> Hollywood world. I've never gone there. Mm -hmm. um, after that, by contrast, going up to northern Canada, Dawson City and Whitehorse. Nice. Uh, be going to Buenos Aires. Um, Hola. In uh, I think in March, something like that. And the film continues to travel by itself too. You know. Um, we have a website where all that stuff is, is posted if, if people are interested mm -hmm. uh, can see where it's playing. Yes, I've been posting some links. Uh, tell us about the after party here in Toronto for the end of time. Um, Coming up uh, uh, this this Saturday. Yes, let me grab a flyer. I'll show you. Yeah, I, I posted the uh, Facebook uh, events page for it. Um, there's a Facebook, it's Suma Presents, for those of you watching in the archives or on YouTube. Um, the um, It's Suma Presents uh, After Party for the End of Time. It's in Toronto. It's at the Old Cinesphere, no less, which is very, very interesting uh, that it is. Uh, tell us about that, and oh, that yeah. you're VJing. Yes. Here, oh, I guess it's, uh, there it is. After Party for the End of Time. So it's on the... 22nd this Saturday uh, this Saturday after the 21st mm -hmm. um, so it's celebrating our hopeful continuation and um, it's uh, mostly for dancing and having a good time and and we'll be doing um, different kinds of image mixing projections um, myself and uh, Si these are some of the names of people participating. Siren Sativa, Zum One, Jaxa Muse, all VJs. She is a muse, isn't she? She is. Yes, <laughs> Jax is her name. Yay, Jax! And then music by author Oskin, 
Anthologic, Jonah K, Zamwan, Lila Mishi, <gasps> Christian Sunflower. Nice. The and we go to 5 a.m. <gasps> and it's at the old Cinesphere. Yeah, it's in. It's a pretty spectacular spot. It's all glass over the water. It mm. should be very nice. Peter Mettler, folks. Um, very much since for 10 years now, uh, ever since the release of uh, Gambling Gods and LSD of 2002, you've been quote unquote VJing a lot. Uh, you always called it live cinema. And I know I've been proud to do Screen Alchemy for you at about, you know, a couple dozen of these uh, <laughs> Omi spiritual gatherings. Some people might call them <clears throat> raves. We wouldn't. But the whole, I, I love the fact of your live cinema work. Uh, which I understand probably better than anyone else as a filmmaker uh, in that history. But uh, you've always explained it as a totally a new form of exhibition and a new form of film production. It's very space age. Uh, talk about your live cinema work, which you will be doing that this Saturday at uh, Atlantis there, which is the old Cinesphere at Ontario Place, folks. It's now a club called Atlantis. <laughs> so talk about that. Atlantis. It was sunk, but it's come up above yeah, no, the surface. No, your temporary. live cinema word. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's meaning in your work because it's so yeah, misunderstood. I'm, but I, I, I'm part of that world. Uh, so I mean, what attracted me to it was uh, I mentioned right at the very beginning. You know, when when I was a kid, more or less, I played the piano, and um, the thing I loved most about playing the piano was improvising on. On piano and was kind of telling stories. Um, when I would play, I would uh, visualize scenarios. And that led me into filmmaking in high school, where, where there was a Super 8 film club. Um, so that interaction between music and filmmaking is very strong in, in my makeup. And when you make films, normal films, they're normally very. Um, labor intensive and they go quite slowly especially during the editing stages i mean you can improvise with the camera fairly well because you're reacting to a situation but when yeah. it comes to yeah. editing you know you're especially in the olden days when we used to cut celluloid oh i love those and, days oh, and tape it i miss those days. slow process though nice nice process but slow process yeah. so i i wanted to do something where the editing becomes a performance. It becomes spontaneous, and where, where the uh, images and sounds become malleable, and you can join things together and layer them on top of each other and create effects, all in real time. And yeah, since ten years now, I've been pursuing that in different ways, and hooked up with you know a, a genius software designer greg hermanovich what a partier uh, also <laughs> electronic music lover yes um who tell us about that software yes well he he's um behind a, a company called derivative and um, a software called touch designer two-time oscar winner folks <laughs> no less and touch designer built or is is the the software with which we co-built um, something called Mixa. So of course I didn't build it because I have know nothing about software, but um, with him, I asked for different kinds of performance possibilities. And together we worked out this uh, pretty incredible mixing system that allows you to do what, what I was describing. The Mettler program. <laughs> yeah, very lucky for me to be yes. able to work with someone like it's that. It's beautiful because I, I love the process. Um, I mean, okay, maybe explain the, the production process because for me, I do see it as those two things where you've prepped it, yes. So not only is it a new style of exhibition where, you know, the high priestess of that event is the DJ and your images are counterpart to that. You're not dealing with the audio, but so it's one... It's a different form of film exhibition. I can show you very quickly the pieces yep. of it if yep. you want to point your and, camera. And, and the fact of film production, because you are doing it live. Let's let's go a little right there. Okay. Um, 
So explain the process. So look how over, you actually, look over here. Okay. Look at this um, and that. Okay, hold on. Uh, okay, start talking, but I'm just adjusting some okay. things. So basically, um, there's banks of images. So if you look at the screen here. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me. Okay. It'll do going. very basic. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm just going to hand hold it. Okay. So there's um, lots of bins of images. So like uh, any one of these bins will have, you know, a group of clips in them. Mm -hmm. And then I can move these clips into these channels. One, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. So there's four channels. And all the stuff below them is ways that I can affect those images or combine the images with each other. Yeah. And I can use this controller down here, if you come down, mm -hmm. um, to actually, you know, mix, like you would mix sound, you mix layers. And what of, would be on some of those channels? What's so, up here? So here's the guy in the air, right? Yeah. And so now if you look at the big screen, that's the output. That's Joe, isn't it? No, that's another guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> and now on another channel, I have that. Okay. Yeah. And on another channel, I have these guys. Uh -huh. And on another channel, these guys. Uh, I love these guys. They're Algerian, I believe, or where are they from? The uh, Turkish. 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 And now I can combine them in different ways together. I mean, that's the most rudimentary sort of aspect yeah. of it, is combining them. Now, as your screen alchemist for at least a couple dozen of these, the screen is not what you typically think. It is in a... <clears throat> Spiritual gathering, aka rave environment, but uh, the where the DJ is the high priestess, so it is a gnarly shape for the screen, and it is pretty psychedelic in a lot of ways um, in its design. And uh, so the prep you do for it, explain how much prep before that night. Besides, you got this excellent gear. Well, the prep is largely in making the gear work, you know, because it's still um, still in development, everything. So a lot of time gets put into making things work um, and, uh, you know, selecting clips, organizing them into groups. Um, as you can see, like there's, you know, probably a thousand clips. In here so right some now. of the effects that you might use, uh, say, I like this image you have now. And let's stick with this image just for a bit and just show... The different things you could do in just in that. Um, I've seen it a million times, but I love this. Yeah, it's a good one. Well, you know, you can do basic things like turn things up and multiply them. Um, you can um, have things drift within themselves. Space Age Cinema, folks. You can create feedback, which is always very interesting. Now talk about why you're doing this, your relationship to the DJ in this environment. Well, um, often we're, um, with a DJ, I mean, DJs usually play their, their things and there's not so much interaction. I'm reacting to them more. But uh, with other live uh, performers such as Fred Frith, who's someone I do shows with regularly, Mm -hmm. um, we're actually reacting to each other. So his music is in reaction to what he's seeing, and my images are in reaction to what I'm hearing. And it's mm -hmm. a completely live um, process. Talk um, about some of the... Uh, well, you, well, we got to talk about the Richie Houghton scene uh, in your film. Um, yes. Detroit. So there's um, Richie's in the film. End of Time, 2012. And uh, we see him in Detroit. Detroit is a subject in the film because uh, Detroit uh, shows epochs like, uh, well, like other cities, but in a, in a pretty pronounced way. It shows you the abandoned mm -hmm. um, car factories, the abandoned neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. It shows you new people who are planting gardens in the ruins of, of, of an old idea. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also the birthplace of techno. 
And uh, techno to me is actually emblematic of uh, the digital world, the information age. And we have um, Richie doing his Plastic Man show there. Um, and movement there at Denf. At Denf, yeah. The Joy Electronic Music Festival, for those that you don't know. That's right. And in fact, he, he performs inside a kind of, um, inside an image. I mean, the, the, it's like a curtain of an image. And uh, he sounds, he creates or triggering directly the images that you see on that curtain. And that's also um, done with Touch Designer, which is uh, mm -hmm. Greg, who I work with. We got some questions from Anon from Texas. Texas. Texas, eh? What's my definition of the phenomena time? Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's in a way the, you know, the big question. And it's the, the question that's probably at the center of, of uh, the film, The End of Time. Um, it's, it's elusive. It's paradoxical. I don't think you can um, put your finger on it. Um, the physics concept of time starts with the Big Bang. That's where they say time started, but but what was before that? You know, no no nobody ventures to guess what was before time or what was before the Big Bang. The Big Bang began something, and it's created an expanding universe, and that action we de define as a, a shape of time, and we have our own shapes or spans is a better word of time that we can fit into that, including our human lifetime, which is a very short blip compared to the life of the universe. So unfortunately, I can't give you a straight answer <laughs> to what is time. Yeah. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a matter of perception. It's a matter of trying to label our experience here. Yeah, because I, I remember string theory. Did you watch the whole of... Uh the essential universe there that three-parter about string theory i watched some of it i didn't watch all of it the it's still on my pile it's really <laughs> interesting that there's two important steps in our history of humanity that has really changed everything that the sea clocks gave us latitude it's the the john harrison clock sea clocks from uh, england it because there was no such thing as longitude uh the, the north south thing and uh it's interesting that all the best scientists including newton at the time were trying to figure out how to figure out this longitude and john harrison's idea was to build sea clocks that he said that quote unquote in order to know where you are on earth it's important to know what time it is and where you are yeah. no nope. what time it is Oh, to know where you are, it's important to know what time it is, of course. Yes, yeah. The, yeah. And, and, and that that is an important development, and, and including time. That string theory, to me, has given us the theory of everything. Still to be proven, because all of physics is a theory. Uh, but it involves frequencies. Um, it's so much, it's the only one, the reason I point it out, is the only theory on Earth that does not fall apart at the center of a black hole. <laughs> and I point that out because maybe you could still film that black hole. If anybody in the world could film it, it's you. Thanks, Shanger. I'll work on it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's the only place on Earth you could stop time. Yeah. That I, I'm the unknown universe. And it does explain the Big Bang. And CERN... In your one of your homelands in Switzerland, that that it will prove string theory right, and and CERN, at CERN time, by the way, because not everybody knows what CERN is, is um, a particle accelerator in Switzerland that's twenty seven kilometers round underground, um, where they shoot uh, ions at each other to create uh, collisions. Um, so these things are shooting at the speed of light in opposite directions, and they collide and create a collision that's similar to the Big Bang. And uh, this is their experiment where they've been, um, when they've now identified what they call the, the God particle, which was a, a particle they believed uh, to exist, mm -hmm. um, but had never been able to prove. And it's essentially a, a 
kind of mini creation recreation of the Big Bang in, it, in itself. And it's the world's largest halogen collider. Hadron collider. Thank you, that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a thing of beauty, and and I don't know. I I I totally love this film, and 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 your your cinemagraphic style and Roland's editing. Roland has edited. Um, talk about your editor, Roland Schlimm. Roland Schlimm. Well, we've edited three films together: Gambling Gods and LSD, uh, Petropolis, and now uh, The End of Time. And it's a it's a funny relationship. Everything about my films is kind of funny and unorthodox in their making, because we both edit, and uh, we take turns editing. Um, he'll edit some part of the film. I'll edit another part of the film. We'll put them together, see how they work. Um, and he's a a very musical editor. He has a very uh, fine sense of rhythm and, and um, yes that he does juxtaposition of how things go together not not always looking at the main line the main information line all the kinds of things i really like so yeah and talk about some of your producers some of the other uh key people involved with this uh, and the end of time by peter mettler folks peter mettler um, well, there's always lots of people involved in any film, even if even if it seems like it's being made by the filmmaker by himself. Um, the film was produced, co-produced in Switzerland uh, with Cornelia Seitler, who's the Swiss co-producer uh, here in Canada with Ingrid Benninger, Tess Girard. Um, and the National Film Board was involved, Jerry Flahive. Um, if you look at the credit list, you know, you can see there's a couple hundred people in the end mm -hmm. involved with, with, with the film. Um, besides myself doing camera, there was also a great uh, student I met teaching in, in Switzerland who became a camera assistant to me and then eventually was doing some of the shooting. She did the India part of the film, Camille Boudin. And um, there's also locally here, Nick de Poncier did some filming in, in CERN. I worked with great musicians, uh, Gabriel Scotti, Vincent Haney, um, sound editor Peter Brecker in, Sw in Switzerland. Um, we did the sound mix. Uh, in Switzerland. And when you were the sound mixer. Well, I, there was a, uh, a sound mixer for in Aiden Benz. Okay. And uh, we worked we worked together, uh, okay. the three of us. Um, yeah, I mean, it goes on and on. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it's good. This is, this is uh, you know, uh, ER, putting things in perspective. Yeah. Uh, what do you have next besides this Saturday? Because Truly, the way you treat live cinema, you're having an, another extra special screening this Saturday. Yeah, the, yeah. Party for the end of time, folks. It's the after party for the end of time, Peter's new film. <laughs> and the, and it looks like we'll be doing it again next week, too, um, at, uh, at another party. I just got a call. Uh, oh, yeah. And I, the name is just escaping me, but I... They're friends of mine, Tom Quo and company. Oh, well, where yeah. and when? On on College Street on the twenty eighth, right uh, two doors down from Sneaky D. Okay. The night of the twenty eighth, Wabi. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Wabi party. That's a pretty big place. Yeah. I'll be mixing mixing there with Tom and uh, and that's the some 28th. other DJs. That's the twenty eighth. Nice. And um, yeah, other than than mixing, which is really uh, fun, I'm. Space Age filmmaking. It, it, Hoping to get outside, actually, because I've been in an edit room for so long, so I'd like to go walking a bit. Are you allowed? <laughs> As Canada's filmmaking, you're not allowed. Not even in the winter. Keep going. <laughs> Make films. <laughs> yeah, and then eventually another film. Yeah. Do you have any in even floating around? Or well, thoughts? it's kind of, yeah, I have like, different ideas. Um, like what? Like, I know um, the whole world's watching. The yeah. Whole world's watching. They want to know what's in Peter's brain. <laughs> I like the idea of the saying, the grass is always greener on the other side. 
that's that's one thing I can say. Um, I'm doing a dance film with um, a local dancer, <gasps> really? um, Yvonne Ung. She's from Malaysia and lives in in Toronto. Um, so we've been planning that for a while. I don't know when we're going to do it, but we're that's uh, on on the decks, ready to go. Um, and uh, I'm also very interested in this medium here in, in live stream, live stream or almost live stream. You know, recording no, things no, no, and putting putting them because you there's certain things that you shoot with a camera when you're out in the field that you you know you're alone and you have to shoot them and edit them, but putting them up more immediately um, online to, to, to be seen. Soon enough, there will be a feature with live stream that it'll instantly go to YouTube as well and archive there. And this right. is already going to be archived. There's a two, three second, let's check the lag. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. Yeah, three. Three, so we're live to the whole world with three seconds Three lag. seconds later. Now, just because it's a 4G USB stick and we're using a laptop, um, but Live stream is the most interactive medium on the planet, right? Uh, I, I, there's a lot of similarities to live stream in your live cinema because it's, it's new forms of filmmaking and most important new forms of um, film exhibition. The the you know, if I, I said this once, I said this a million times that if the act of filmmaking when you are shooting is a private act and when you are editing is a private act, um, and that only when it's a public um, done, it's a public uh, release. Um, if that is the overall concept of film, when you're doing live stream, everyone's a critic. There's a three second lag there. We're, for me, I'm doing a film. I'm an anthropological documentary filmmaker and this is live to the world. I mean, I remember the day we were evicted on November 23rd, 2011, you sent me a gorgeous text message. We were live being evicted from St. James Park and there was 80,000 people. It was the most watched Occupy eviction ever. And we were the only Occupy live stream that did not go down. Mm. It, that was a miracle in itself, but it was really nice getting the text message from you. But mm. can you imagine, I built my whole life as a filmmaker to be live streaming an event live and 80,000 people in over 150 countries were watching live, not just on Occupy Toronto, but mirrored all over the world. That That is a pretty powerful feeling yeah, in the hands amazing. of a filmmaker. Yeah, sure. Right? Compared to like trying to get, you know, 50 seats into a theater every night in a, in a cinema and you only have two weeks to do it. It's quite a different, uh, different It's It's ratio. live. I mean, there's a lot of factors, but you know, um, you should, Peter, you should. Um, and this software here is the greatest software ever. Procaster, livestream.com. You can't get any better, right? Especially our account. Yeah, but, Procast. Yeah, and 4G hookup and your mobile anywhere. Right. right. Uh, but filmmaking on the go, you would be great at it. But what, what else future, in the futuristic? Uh, well, I think that's enough, isn't it? I mean, I'm mixing, I'm shooting, I'm traveling, well, showing uh, films. I'm. Um... We are in the rhythm. <laughs> I know. We just we just wanted. This is an interview. You know. Uh, yes, we're friends, but this is you know this is a whole different context. Yeah. No, but I mean that those are the things I'm pursuing, and of course, like Werner Herzog says, um, reading books is really important because I think we can get carried away with um, our technology in the sense that. It, it allows us to go so fast and to be so preoccupied that we actually lose our connection with the real world sometimes. And so I'm, I'm definitely a fan of maintaining connection with the real world, which is why I say I'd like to go walking, um, because I'd like to be in a technologically free mind space and physical space for periods of time so that when I come back to the technology, I'm, I'm healthy. And uh, I think that's quite important. Mm -hmm. But you're Canada's filmmaker. Canada, <laughs> go on. It's just... But I'm I'm also like if you watch my films, they're they're also they question film, right? Like there, there's a self-reflexive nature in in how they're made, and you're always being reminded that you're watching a film. And and a picture of light 
mm -hmm. which is about the Northern Lights, at the same time, it, it asks the question, well, did you ever really see the Northern Lights? Mm -hmm. You know, or are you only seeing the Northern Lights in this film? Mm -hmm. Like how much of your life is actually understood mm -hmm. by having watched things, by having been mediated somehow? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it questions that relationship to, to the real world through all the images that we have, through all the technologies mm -hmm. that we use mm -hmm. that somehow separate us from from the natural world. Yes, uh, was Harold Ennis. Uh, I always get mixed up between the son and the father, but Harold Ennis, the colleague of uh, McLuhan. McLuhan here in Toronto, always said, he always had the storefront, general store, storefront mentality about media that, yes, exactly as you said, the, the more interactive we are, the more wired we are, you know, the more we yearn for the live yeah. touch, the live, you know, like how we used to get our information in front of the general store in the town, the village center, you know, there's always that, the live event. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. There's, um, strangely making something immediate <laughs> again, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that was kind of separating us from the present. Dan, Dan Brown's on, safety department. Hi, Dan. Yar. <laughs> Yar. Every user is a real person. This is the live chat with a three second lag. Yar. Tech separated us, but now it's bringing us back together. Mm -hmm. The live chat. Don't forget the books. The books. <laughs> all the writers out there all thank you going, it's not all about But it's about. true, you know, the process of uh, reading a book, sometimes I have to push myself into it again. It's different, you know. It, it's um, when, when you read and you imagine and you carry this thing with you, like as fast as you can read a book is in a few days if you're full on, right? Mm -hmm. and, and how you dream, how you imagine, how you digest the way your brain works, it's, it's a very different experience. And it's, we speak of interactive in a way it's more interactive than, you know, sitting and watching a television show or, uh, or whatever, something on a monitor. Mm -hmm. Yar. Any final thoughts? Cause I know you have to go uh, shortly. Uh, final thoughts, final thoughts. Well, we keep going. We keep going and going. <laughs> And going and we learn and we we get better and we get nicer mm, I, how would you okay how would you define cinema film oh man no i i, I just I, how do you define well, I, to, to me i can tell you what it what what it is what it means to me why i do it it's really a, a tool it's an interaction with with a technology that is current um that helps me to learn about who we are not just who i am but who we are and how we see and what we're doing um in some ways i always think making films is a little bit of a dance with the devil too because it's because it is technology it's wrapped up in commerce and money and there's a lot of ego involved in, in film but those are the things of today and and um i i try to em embrace them and learn from them and and create something for an audience that hopefully um can share and inspire yeah yeah for me cinema i always defined it as a, an interesting object moving through time within the rhythm of a space you know to me that was always cinema because mm -hmm. you come out of the experimental film background just like as i do uh, maybe quickly just explain that whole experimental film tradition well what i mean there's um what's experimental film it's actually like all the genre names of, of film are they're problematic like how, how can you say something is limited to being a documentary or limited to being a fiction or limited or then you go to experimental which is sort of a catch-all for everything else i mean 
do we call art experimental all art experimental it, it, it's um a process of creativity experimental film is really just not doing something that is uh you know based on a, a an existing form usually with commercial intention it's just being artistic and creative and, and exploring and um that's how art should be that's how creative process should be and how would you define your your films uh, as what genre a filmmaker would you be <laughs> i mean I'm, for me i'm an anthropological documentary genre i always have been and always will yeah um, how would you de define yourself it depends i define different films different ways because i don't actually think it's that like i, I think you're leaving something out by defining it that way but um they're musical they're anthropological their form is experiential i would say like they bring you into an experience they take you through states of consciousness they're meditative um yeah well that's a few words i used to describe <laughs> oh, that's good that's good no i enough times uh people do take that for granted uh you know but i don't know i guess it's the anthropological documentary Filmmaker in and the funny thing is they show in documentary festivals all the time uh, but i think the na the nature or the the interpretation of that genre name documentary has widened a lot in um in the last decade and it's widened to actually include the idea that the documentation is a state of mind i mean that what is being documented is what is being perceived it's how we look at things that's being documented that's mm. part of the, the documentation and nowadays with the hyperspeed rise of the citizen journalists really in the last two years with the rise of live stream it, it's just exploding that it's who is also doing the documentation mm -hmm. you know in our era you know you're making films say 30 years ago plus and uh you're always thinking neck. It's going to be 16 mil if you can afford it, 35, but it's neck. It's like as a film worker, you're going to shoot neck. I mean, always. That's just the way it is. To now, like, there's not been any, pretty practically less than 1% of all Hollywood films. Are, no neck. No neck. In the neck. last year, no neck has been shot. Deluxe and Technicolor. Yeah. They don't process neck. Uh, so how that's all evolving and the, the fact that the internet, the World Wide Web, has only been around since 89, that, um, and the pinnacle of that interactivity is live stream. And even the, the, the point of you being able to live stream um, DVD quality and that the viewer at home could receive live stream at DVD quality has only been around for about a year and a half, two years. It's the pinnacle of interactivity and I think you'd be wild. Look at that nice wide angle. <laughs> That's just arms length. Uh, uh, I was surprised that you said live stream um, as one of your future considerations. I like the idea of bringing cinema in, into um, into your living room or your living space uh, more immediately. And, and, you know, bypassing the complicated structures that exist for, for distribution and for theatrical release and so on. I mean, I still think... But then the question of authorship is gone when it's in that state. Yeah. Well, it can, it can be or can't be, but... Um, it is. But, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't matter to me, I guess, is what I mean so much. It's more like... Sharing the experience is what's important. And the thing, though, about a cinema versus your living room, of course, is you're committed to going into a dark room and letting this this work take you away. You're, you're, you're saying, take me, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even if we want to do that at home with a computer monitor, we tend to get distracted very easily and don't do that. Mm -hmm. But it'd be great to find a way that you could do that in your home, you know, that you you could stream something to someone in a nice on a nice big screen with good sound and and take them away like you do in, in the cinema. That would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Safety department has a question for you there. He says, Peter, would you ever consider releasing 
any of the hundreds of great films that exists in the outtakes of <laughs> The End of Time. Well, that would mean that they'd have to be made, I guess, uh, or just released as, as raw footage. And um, I do try to hang on to uh, my old footage, especially of um, Gambling Gods and LSD, which had a lot more different scenes in it and, and interesting documentation, I think. Uh, to to somehow um, yeah make it available in some way to to be watched yeah for sure it's all it's all labor and uh, it all costs money so they got to find ways of, of doing that would love to see the storyboards of it I bet one percent of all intelligent species have time as a label like AM PM. Mm. We'd love to see a storyboard if that's possible. Just reading the live chat for mm -hmm. those of you watching in the archives. Yar. Well, thank you for this. Thank and you, um, yeah, uh, at the end of time is still playing uh, at um, TIFF Bell Lightbox here in Toronto. Uh, Peter's new film is Peter Mettler, folks. Uh, um, 2012, uh, brand new release of. Uh, his brand new opus, uh, The End of Time, is playing here in Toronto. It's going to be playing in the States uh, later on, Australia, uh, Poland, and a few other places. There's the, the website is theendoftimemovie.com. Yeah. And uh, my guests are here. Your guests are here. <laughs> I see you I, intuitively. Hi. Bye. All righty. Bye. Thank you. Alrighty, so thank you folks. My name is Dee Shanger. I'm a mod and live stream director here at Occupy Toronto. And thank you for tuning in. That was Peter Mettler. And in about a half hour time, give me maybe an hour, um, we are uh, doing a Peter Mettler movie marathon for the next day and a half. Uh, it's all his films in order back to back. Hey, Dee, it's the Oscar winner. Uh, Yar. Hey, okay, so Yar Yar. And uh, Yar, uh, Yar, <laughs> Yar, alrighty, so, uh, that's it, okay, um, thank you there, folks, bye-bye.